So I want to take you a little bit of a deeper look and show you where the items come from because as you continue to do this work and as we talk about doing the work as a state, I think it's really important to look what's on there and why it's on there. Okay? Because there are reasons why all these different things are up on here. Now this is a modification of the checklist and one of the things that we want to talk about today is perhaps a South Carolina version of the IHI version of the WHO checklist <laughs> because there's some things I think that we've learned in the last couple years about how to make this thing better than it already was. The constraints of the WHO prevent us from changing the WHO checklist, but nothing keeps us from changing the South Carolina checklist. That belongs to the people of the state of South Carolina and not to the WHO. So what's different about this guy? And what's different about this guy is up there you can see is venous thromboembolism prophylaxis needed. So that's on there when it wasn't. And then here's the one that tips the hat to uh, the risk of hypothermia. Okay, so it's got some modifications, special for, for the skip measures. Um, in the United States, and a lot of people have used it in the U.S. to meet those specific needs. So we can go through column by column and look where this stuff came from. There's a skip measure at the bottom, this is the first column. And then up at the top, you're going to see the Joint Commission Universal Protocol laced throughout this thing. And that was because, at the time, the Joint Commission and the WHO, actually, were working very closely together. There was already a political relationship there. And the WHO felt that all the things the Joint Commission was doing regarding wrong site, wrong patient, wrong operation um, were all very, very relevant to improving patient safety. So you're going to see it in a couple places in the checklist. So that comes from the Joint Commission. And then this is all stuff that the WHO added. And we're going to, I'll go down and I'll give you some examples of why and how it doesn't apply to everybody everywhere. Okay. Is the anesthesia machine and medication check complete? Now, anesthesiologists check their machines before every case. It's a matter of habit. Do they need to be reminded to check their machines in developed countries? I don't know. We could probably have a debate about whether that's important or not. How much time does it waste to say, did you check it? Probably not very much, so maybe it's a good thing. That was put up there not for us. That was put up there because they don't check the machine in a big hunk of the rest of the world. And it was up there, put on the checklist, because the WHO wanted to say, checking your machine is important, and we want you to check your machine. And there's a book that stands behind this thing that tells you how to check your machine, if you want to go that deep. There's not enough room up here to tell you how to check your machine. There's a pulse oximeter on the patient and functioning. I can guarantee you that in, an, in operating rooms in the United States, a patient would never go in the operating room without a functioning pulse oximeter. That's just a given. I mean, 99.99, it's higher than any of the skip measures, I'm sure. In terms of compliance, does that need to be on a U.S. thing? No, probably doesn't. Does a patient have an allergy? That's like a no-brainer. The only objection there is that it's already been checked six times, but the reason why it's there is because a bunch of anesthesiologists told us that they had patients that had made it through the checks and didn't, didn't say or they didn't hear that the circulating nurse knew the patient had an allergy that they didn't know they had. Is there a difficult airway or an aspiration risk? And this was to say, if there is that kind of a problem, please get help. Stop for a minute. Think. Is this airway going to be hard? Because that doesn't always get done. And while every patient in the United States has an airway evaluation, a mental body score, a thyroid mental distance, or some kind of evaluation of whether they're going to be an easy airway to handle, that doesn't happen everywhere in the world, and the WHO wanted to make sure that it did. And then finally, the risk of blood loss. The risk of blood loss, and this is still exceptionally controversial, and the reason why it is is because a lot of people feel like that's telling them how to practice medicine. So whether or not you think that is important should be on the checklist, I think, can be debated. We had a couple points that we wanted to make with it. One is, if you think you're going to lose more than a unit of blood, then you ought to probably think about whether you need more IV access than you would normally have for a case. And the other is, this checklist can be used in kids. Okay, It's the only place that says children on the whole checklist. 
And that's not, I mean, the fact that it does say kids up there is, is not by chance. It was there at the behest of a pediatrician who read the checklist of my house and told me to go tell them to have kids on the checklist. <laughs> that was my way. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to go to the middle column, and I want to show you again the Joint Commission is, is back to meet the needs of the Joint Commission and the safety needs of the patient with regards to their standard. The next thing has got to do with things that are in the skip measure, but that third box up there, antibiotic prophylaxis given in the last 60 minutes, is what makes a big hunk of the difference in the rest of the world. And I think over the last 10 years, we've gotten a lot better in the United States at giving antibiotics on time. In some places, we look like we're a lot better than we really are, because I think we got a lot better at filling the paperwork out that says we give antibiotics, right? But still, most of the impact of that is in places outside the developed world. There's the venous thromboembolism piece. Again, that's not on the one for Tanzania and places where heparin would be a dangerous drug. And then down here, again, any, actually the Joint Commission has backed off on this. And that is the equipment and essential uh, imaging display. The standard keeps changing, and it was on there for a bit, and now actually has been retracted. I think most people that see the checklist think that part's important. If you need x-rays for the operation, you ought to have them in the operating room and make sure that you have them. If you need special equipment, you ought to check before you put the knife on the skin that you're actually ready to proceed. All right, now the thing I really want to talk to you about, and that is what this is all about, okay? And I want you to look at two things that are on here. The first one, the one that gets the most resistance in operating rooms by operating room personnel, and that is, will everyone please state their name and role? That is up there at the insistence of the operating room nurses of the world, okay? It was not put up there to embarrass anybody. It was not put up there to do anything except give everyone a voice in the operating room. And it was a chance for people to say something at the beginning of the operation and it was felt by the people that made this checklist to be so important that it deserved its own line. Now in the United States, I know all of us sitting around this table have probably worked in places where you did not know who was standing next to you in the O. I know for a fact that that has been the case for me, to the point that I'm so bad with names, I make them, people write them on the whiteboard in the room so I can always remember who's standing with me when I was still doing surgery, but that's clearly an issue. But the other piece is getting somebody to talk at the beginning makes it more likely that they're going to talk later. That's why we do icebreakers at cocktail parties, in addition to having a cocktail. All right, anticipated critical events. The language down here is not perfect, and I think we could probably make it better for the South Carolina. Anticipated critical events, I still don't quite know what that means. A tool knew what it meant somehow. But the idea here is to talk to each other. Surgeon anesthetists or anesthesiologists and nursing team, everybody gets to say something and we're going to share a plan. Okay, now this lays the plan out a little bit, but the idea is share a plan with each other. Now when you show this to people, to lay people, they're like, what do you normally do? You mean you go into the operating room and nobody says what the plan is? And the reality is that's the reality, that the plan doesn't a lot of time get shared. And that's what this is all about. And everything, every line that's on there is because, most of them are because of a story that somebody had to tell, that they didn't know something that the surgeon knew that really would have impacted the, um, the anesthetic, like how long does the case take? And I've seen that happen where you go in and, and you're doing a little case and the anesthesiologist thinks it's gonna be an hour, hour and a half, and it takes three minutes, and you're like, okay, wake them up, and they got the muscle relaxant that lasts for an hour, and now you're in the suit. Um, anyway, so that's why that's up there. Anticipated blood loss, again, the plan, and implants and equipment needed, and anesthetists and each patient specific concerns. And then, finally, to the nurses is the sterility. Now, this has been debated a lot. 
most operating room nurses like to have that on there still, even though checking sterility is like inbred in them and they do it every single time. The other thing it does is it gets them involved in the conversation. And then finally, the last piece, it's a standard of practice to count instruments, sponge, and needle counts in the United States. It is not the standard of practice everywhere else in the world, believe me. No, it is not. Um, in many places, unless a large body cavity is open, none of that stuff gets counted. In a lot of places, needles never get counted. And certainly in areas of the developing world, they don't count anything. Um, so this is bringing a new standard to the rest of the world. And then these all come from the WHO. Nurse verbal request from the team, how shall I record the name of the procedure? Now I must say I had a little bit to do with that because I cannot tell you how many malpractice cases I have reviewed where what the resident writes, the surgeon writes, and the nurse writes in the record about what operation was done are all different. And doesn't that look dandy in front of a jury? Okay? That's not the reason why it's up there though, to make it consistent, it's so that everybody knows what in the world got done. Like somebody was telling me, exploratory yesterday when we were talking, exploratory laparotomy, well, what in the world is that? I mean, that could be anything from like, you know, peak and shriek to I went in and took half the bowel out, you know? So get back on the same page at the end of the operation. Then finally, how shall I label the specimens, including the patient name, are there any equipment problems to be addressed? That's their, our biomedical engineers said, please do that for us so that we can make sure that we fix the things that don't work that are in the operating room. And then to everybody, what are the key concerns for recovery and management of the patient? A lot of people then will take that last piece and blow it out into a little bit of a debriefing, which is a great thing to do. Is the WHO checklist down to why the little pieces are actually on there. So now you know. This is why this is there, this is why that's there, this is why that's there. And you can see that there are different needs that it's trying to meet.